Good afternoon, everyone. This is Ali Mostardo, Senior Association Manager of PPRA. Thank you for joining us today for the PPRA Ahead of the Curb webinar, Small Agency Big Plans. This is the third webinar in the Ahead of the Curb webinar series for roadresource.org. We do have you all on mute for the webinar and we'll be using the question function for any questions. Questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. The recording of this webinar will be provided to all attendees via email and will also be available on roadresource.org. Brief introduction before we begin. Lindsay Matouche is president and CEO and Grace Sansbury is an account executive at Vario Consulting, the marketing firm that has partnered with PPRA to create roadresource.org. Joining Lindsay and Grace today are Steve Lander, local agency pavement, pavements practice leader with the group and CJ O'Neill, public streets director with the town of Matthews, North Carolina. We will now turn the webinar over to Lindsay and Grace. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are excited to be here today um, and particularly excited about this webinar uh, for the ability to feature really how a pretty small agency gained some big ground by committing to smart planning and just thinking about how to approach their network a little differently. So um, today you have myself and Grace from Vario. And in addition to us, you see Steve and CJ up there, so I'll give each of their bios in just a minute. Um, and a brief word on uh, who's putting on the webinar. This is the uh, work of three associations, EMA, the Asphalt Emulsion Manufacturers Association, ISSA, the International Slurry and Surfacing Association, and ERA, the Asphalt Recycling and Reclaiming Association, who, who really in 2015 um, started asking agencies around the country to say, what is it that you need from us, from the industry to help you navigate the world of preservation and recycling um, and network management? Um, and the answer that really many of you provided was to create a more streamlined hub uh, to gather technical resources and network information. And, and so they came together through the Pavement Preservation Recycling Alliance. Um, to build what you know as roadresource.org. That's a 500-page website that kind of streamlines a lot of the technical insight and other information out there. And these webinars are just one resource that uh, we put together to make it easier for you to know how to ultimately uh, gain ground with your network. So today, um, we've got a few things uh, a few things lined up for you. Uh, we'll be spending some time with CJ, who I'll introduce in just a second, of Matthews, North Carolina, who's going to share how he has maintained uh, his network with a relatively small budget. Uh, we'll talk about plan management. Steve's here to help us, who consulted CJ on uh, some of how to approach that network and engage decision makers. Today, I think more than any webinar we've done, you're gonna hear quite a bit about how to bring um, your electeds or uh, city council members along in this process. We'll show you some of the tools and calculators on the site that will help you um, take a couple steps forward and then we'll do our best to reserve some time for Q&A. As we go throughout today, um, you see the um, chat function or the questions function on your um, toolbar there and I'll be monitoring that as we go so we'll answer some quick questions as we go and then we'll um, we'll save the rest for Q&A at the end. Uh, so before we start i um, like to always say a quick thank you. Uh, in our work in this industry we probably on a daily basis are so impressed when we have a chance to hear from pavement managers behind the scenes what you guys are doing all day, every day, constantly juggling, not enough resources to meet tremendous needs, keeping our communities moving, um, and, and never hearing enough of those two very important words from the taxpayers that you work very hard to serve. So on behalf of all of us, uh, as we start, a big uh, thank you for all that you're always doing. Uh, what we've heard in building this webinar series is that now, always, these are topics at play, but especially in light of COVID and looking at infrastructure budgets, we're hearing all kinds of agencies talking about budget cuts and halted projects and down revenue. We're hearing people struggling with freezing budgets. Um, some people are dealing with expedited budgets on the other hand, um, or talks of stimulus. You're also dealing with public pressure to fix roads and saying, hey, while we're at home, fix the roads. Uh, so there is, it seems like this sort of increased pressure on all of you who are maintaining pavement and figuring out how to stretch resources further. 
so the question to us is with increased budget demands, how do you continue to improve your road network? And how do you stretch what seem like they're becoming even more limited dollars even further and use every dollar with the greatest effectiveness possible? So today we'll come at this from um, four key ways. We'll talk about really understanding your network. CJ is gonna give us behind the scenes of what he did to really understand his network. We'll talk about communicating the ramifications of different treatment plans to uh, electeds, um, even to taxpayers, and thinking about how communicating those ramifications will help you protect your road budget. And we'll talk about cost-effective alternatives and looking for every option to make a dollar go further. And then we'll talk about uh, how CJ and Matthews really developed a plan and stuck to it and, and take a look at, you know, even if you, you haven't been running a payment management plan for many years, why now might be uh, the best time to start. Um, so before we go any further, I wanna take a quick poll to understand a little bit more about who's on the call today. Uh, so the first poll is, do you have adequate roadway maintenance funding? And this is just a yes or no answer. So I'll ask you guys to uh, submit that quickly. Okay, we've got about 60% of you voted. We'll give it another 10 seconds or so. All right, it looks like about 18% uh, of you said yes, and 82% uh, of you said no, you do not have adequate roadway maintenance funding. So what we're dealing with is largely, uh, most of you are underfunded. And we'll launch the next poll. We're gonna do uh, three of these real quick in a row. Um, do your elected officials and decision makers understand the ramifications of reduced or increased budgets, yes or no? So how much do elected officials and decision makers understand the impact of different funding levels on their roads? Oh, this is interesting. Okay, we'll give it another 10 seconds or so. This is, this is closer than I anticipated. It looks like a little over half of you say no, they don't understand, and 46% of you say yes, they do understand. So on either side of that equation, I think today you're gonna walk away with some new tools or ideas about how to share this out. And then uh, the last poll, does your agency need to expand the pavement maintenance toolbox? Uh, yes or no, specifically meaning, do you need um, more treatments, more tools in your toolbox? Oh, interesting. Okay, give me another five seconds or so to vote. All right, so 89% of you said, yes, we need to expand the pavement maintenance toolbox. So also today, CJ will be sharing how he expanded his toolbox um, and how he uh, went about identifying treatments that he was comfortable trying on his network and, and then honestly bringing different decision makers along and understanding why he was trying some of those treatments. Uh, Grace, I think we have lost the uh, slides on your screen, if you don't mind. Let's see, how about now? Perfect. All right, so without further ado, I have the pleasure of introducing CJ O'Neill. 
CJ is the Public Works Director for the Town of Matthews. I'll let him tell you about his network. Um, his department has 33 people and he oversees about a third of the town's operating budget. He's also the liaison with the town's Transportation Advisory Committee. So that's why he brings that really great perspective about how to help others who influence budget decisions understand what's happening at the department. Actively involved in APWA, he's been the president um, of the North Carolina chapter. He has a bachelor's in civil engineering from UNC Charlotte and uh, his professional engineering license. Uh, so CJ, I will turn it over to you to tell us just a little bit about um, the network at the town of Matthews. Give us a quick look. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, looks like I have to update my bio a little. Actually, I'm no longer the liaison to the TAC. I've handed that off to our town engineer, so she's doing a great job with that. Um, oh, there you go. <laughs> the, uh, our, our town of Matthews, uh, we're a suburb of Charlotte. Uh, we have roughly 33,000 people here next to a population center of uh, a little bit over 800,000. And we have a, a huge um, growing population outside of Matthews. So a lot of the traffic that we see are people traveling from outside of Matthews through Matthews going to Charlotte. Our road network is roughly 100 centerline miles. Uh, roughly 75% of that are lower volume roads, residential, things like that. Uh, we have roughly 34 lane miles of collector roads, some arterials. Um, our, in North Carolina is a little different than a lot of other areas. We have a lot of roads owned by the state. There are no county maintained roads. It's a state that maintains some of the larger volume roads. So the interstates that we have 45 going through our town and some of the other major roads going through town are maintained by DOT, which is good. I, I try to tell people when they ask what's what, if it has a pothole in it, it's probably a state road. If it doesn't, then it's probably one of our roads. So uh, to help with this, we have roughly 33 people in uh, my department. Our operating budget's about $6 million. Um, but with everything going on, uh, all the projects in the area um, affecting us roughly 1.3 billion dollars for the projects in Matthews over the next few years and that doesn't include a light rail system that's probably going to be closer to four to five billion dollars so we have a lot going on in this little town I guess so let me um now quickly introduce Steve uh, who's going to provide the other uh side of the perspective today Steve is a uh a PE with his project manager, uh, as a project manager for the Kersher Group, and has over 26 years of design and construction experience, including about three and a half years with hands-on experience um, at a paving contractor, and then about 17 years in uh, asset management. So his big passion and work is all about helping municipal clients create really robust pavement management plans that bring their um, officials, their electeds along and help them have some understanding and create complete pavement management plans that work, especially during tough times. Um, so that is a that is a bread and butter of, of Steve's work. And I know um, Steve and CJ have worked together for quite some time in thinking about the network at Matthews. And so the two of them are going to kind of share the story, the history, and, and how they've helped uh, so many different influencers and decision makers um, align around a, a smart plan to advance the roads at uh, Matthews. So Steve, start by giving us a snapshot of Matthews in 2014. Excellent, thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I am quite pay, uh, passionate about pavement management. Uh, it's uh, interesting when you get out of school, what you're gonna end up doing, but uh, so, Anyway, I've known CJ uh, since 2007, and uh, while I was with another uh, engineering company, we provided the uh, pavement condition surveys for 2007 and 2011. And it was between uh, 2011 and 14 where CJ kind of got the idea that his network, while it had a pretty high PCR pavement condition rating value, that the network was starting to slide, um, that he, he got the feeling that he was underfunded and they were using a worse first project management approach or project selection approach. And, uh, and, and his intuition was right. You know, so when we did the survey in 14, you can see um, that the 14 survey 
that the very good roads significantly declined and the fair, poor, and very poor, they significantly went up. And that's exactly what you don't want to have happen. You want to actually have it go the other way. You know, so you have to understand your health of your network and you got to understand the trends. And so, you know, what we're here to talk about is how we're going to talk to elected officials to uh, to possibly increase the funding and to get away from a worse first project selection approach. Next slide, please. Steve, um, quickly, I, we're getting a question. Is PCR synonymous with PCI? They're similar. Um, so PCR was developed uh, for North Carolina it's, uh, and used by more, most North Carolina. So it's, it's a scale from zero to 100. So it's similar, but it's, uh, there are some differences. So what CJ was looking for, when, when I started with Kersher, he was looking for a more analytical approach uh, to, uh, to the pavement management uh, with performance modeling and project selection. You know, and so as a company, we, uh, we offer what we call complete pavement management. It's a, it's a plan that maximizes the benefit and level of service. It minimizes the risk and the cost. And in order to do that, you have to manage change within each of the categories. Uh, which are on the right. Grace, if you could advance the slide. And it starts with a business process review where we sit down with an agency and discuss where they're at, uh, where they need to be, uh, you know, what kind of goals are they looking to achieve in the PCR or PCI, um, what type of maintenance activities. Now, we didn't do this with the town of Matthews, although it was basically established by CJ in years of uh, brute force and uh, talking to his. Uh, his uh, board, um, so we didn't need to do that for him, but it, it is a, an essential part um, that folks have to buy into this program uh, in order for it to be a success. And, and it's from the business process review that leads to the other portions of complete payment management. And it's from the plan, uh, from, from this written down document that folks uh, agree upon where you, fig you know what kind of data collection you need, uh, what distresses you're collecting, then the software that you need, uh, the next advance, the software to help us get reach our goals. And the software is a network level solution, which helps us with the project level, and that's your project selection. Next. And we need to be able to have performance management. And what that means is this is where we're going to leverage the data to be able to demonstrate to the elected officials the consequences of different funding scenarios and also to is adding or subtracting different maintenance activities. And then construction management, all of this would be for naught. If, if we, we could have everything in place, but if it doesn't go down in the field correctly, we're gonna have a disaster. And when we have disasters, people usually stop using maintenance activities. They say, we tried it and we're not doing that again. And usually it's, you pick, the, it could have been the wrong road, uh, the contractor got out there and, and didn't didn't look at the specs. No one, you know, inspected the job. So good specs, construction inspection, and then lastly, uh, the rest of the assets in your right of way. It's you know cleaning ditches, pipes, it's potholes, it's it's everything that you're recording. And so this is a cyclical process that we help our agencies with to help manage that uh, pavement management network. Next slide, please. We'll jump right into the data collection for Matthew. So in the 07 and the 2011 surveys, they used the PCR or the North Carolina-based uh, rating methodology. And, and CJ wanted to use the same rating methodology in 14, which we did. Even knowing some of the shortcomings that it had, and it, it did not collect severity and extent for all the distresses. And also, too, is that it had a really, uh, it didn't catch environmental cracking early. Um, so we had to add transverse cracking so that we could catch early environmental cracking. So just so you know that we reported uh, back in the PCR terms, and then we modeled based on a PCR modified. So you'll see that the PCRs don't match up from what we showed in the earlier slide when we show um, the modeling. You know, and so things to consider uh, when you're looking at different rating methodologies that 
you want to make sure does does it support your agency's goals so it goes back to the plan mm -hmm. you know is it quality data is it concise is it repeatable and does it allow you to pick the the right maintenance activities based on the way that you do business at the end of the day if the software picks the wrong stuff the wrong treatments then then we have a problem so we got to make sure uh, that you're getting the right distresses to make decisions from so you know be careful um, you know when someone comes along and says that they have a cheap rating methodology it, it might be true but if it doesn't collect what you need uh, then it's not going to serve you and so you got to make sure that the rating methodology serves the uh, goals of the network next slide please so at the end of a survey, it's typical where uh, we have a street listing that has a maintenance activity generated for each segment uh, in, in the network. And so uh, every segment has some form of maintenance activity and we call this the backlog of your network. So if you had unlimited funding, you, can, you could fix everything in the network, right? And so you see in this pie chart, there's the percentages of each of the maintenance activities. Nobody has the funding enough to uh, to do that right so what we have to do is we have to be smart about how we select the projects the most efficient matter next slide please and that's where uh, optimization comes in and uh, we say the optimization is the how of the three r's it's the right treatment right roadway right time you know and so the most robust payment management software programs use optimization for project selection which is based on benefit and benefit is defined as the area between performance curves for doing and not doing a maintenance activity. So, so based on the condition of your network and how much money you have to spend, the software should answer the million dollar question, how much money to spend in each of the maintenance categories per year? You know, that's what's known as the right mix of fixes. So obviously, if we select one project and we do it just right at the right time, you're gonna save money because it's gonna last longer. If you can do that across your entire network, it has a compounding effect and you're gonna get the highest return on investment because you are treating your whole network and, and, and getting the highest return on investment. So I'll turn it over to Grace. Hey, Steve, before you turn it over to Grace, two quick questions. Um, PCR ranges associated with very good, good, fair, poor, very poor. Is it similar to PCI or are there big differences? Well, you know, it's interesting when you when you go and look uh, on the web, there it doesn't seem like there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, cohesion, I guess. There's a lot of different, uh, you know, answers to that question, I guess. So I think, you know, uh, you know, up to 100 to 80 is good. You know, and then we, we go good, fair, poor. And fair is usually between 80 and 60, and then poor okay. is 60 and below. So, but it varies. Uh, and then quickly, were inspections done with boots on the ground or with a van? Uh, so, our, and good good question. It, ours, this survey and the last surveys were all done visually, windshield okay. survey. Thank you. All right, Grace. Take it away. So if an agency doesn't know exactly which distress they're looking at, there's a tool at Road Resource to help them do um, explore just that. Exactly. Yeah. Road Resource. Um, we heard this question all over the place when we surveyed agencies across the country, uh, across North America. Um, what if I don't know what the right treatment is for my road or what if I don't even know where to start? Um, so we built this tool underneath the treatment toolbox um, that allows you to explore pavement distress using photos. Um, so this is not the equivalent of driving your roads um, with a professional um, at, next to your side, but it's similar in that you can scroll through this page and get a really good understanding of what pavement distresses look like and compare photos with your roads. So uh, if I'm seeing a similar distress like this rutting example here on my roads, I can scroll through, grab a photo, what this what this uh, page shows me a couple different things gives me a good idea of the pavement condition of the road in this photo tells me a little bit about the primary distress that's being exhibited a couple possible solutions that would alleviate or um, fix this primary distress 
And it also shows me a little bit more about secondary distresses happening in this photo and uh, gives you the chance to click through and learn a little bit more about some of the possible treatments for each of these um, photos. So this is a great place to start if you're not sure um, what distresses your roads are exhibiting or what the possible candidates could be. Obviously, there's no, um, there's no substitution for a professional evaluation and recommendation, but this is a great place to get started if you're thinking about expanding your toolbox and wondering what roads might be candidates for new treatments. This is a great place to give you a picture of what that might be. And then on the other side, we've also built a similar tool, the Pavement Criteria Tool, which you can click over to here, or on the roadresource.org side, you can also drop down here and learn a little bit about your pavement by inputting criteria. If the photo tool isn't something that works for you um, or a pattern you're not used to, you can input things like pavement condition, primary distress, road type, and surface type. What it does is gives me a few ideas. Some of the candidates gray out, indicating that they're not good solutions for a road in this condition. Um, and some of them stick around, and you can learn more about each of these uh, treatments and applications that may be possible solutions for a road in this condition. So this is a really good place to start if you're trying to better understand your network or even communicate it with decision makers who might not be as familiar working with roads day in and day out, what exactly they're looking at, what's the difference between a surface treatment and a rehab. Why do I need to be worrying about these things and caring about what treatment goes down on what road at what time? So again, that's at roadresource.org under the treatment toolbox section. And uh, I'll hand it back over to the Matthews crew here. So just a little bit more framing here. Once you have identified a couple possible solutions for your roads and you're communicating with your electeds, it's very important, and Steve's gonna get into the details here, to help them understand the decisions that they make for your network that don't happen in a vacuum. Excellent. So this is actually the real fun part of pavement management for me is uh, being able to take the uh, the data and and leverage it and to explain the story to folks that don't understand anything about pavement. You know, and they always say that a picture or a chart is worth a thousand words. And a clear picture or chart is worth 10,000 words. You know, so when uh, CJ and I were presenting this to the board, uh, it was really kind of what stopped them. You know, I, I was showing them what the 2014 funding looked like uh, with that PCR modified, and it's a pretty grim looking story. And one of the council members just said, so what you're saying here is that we need to spend $880,000, and they were getting $550 thousand dollars and I said that's exactly what needs to happen now you know what happened though is that they didn't just automatically give CJ eight hundred and eighty thousand dollars they bumped it up to six hundred and sixty thousand so it was a start and so over the mm -hmm. years they've understood that if they if they cut the funding uh, what's going to happen and then what's going to happen when they add funding and that, what I find kind of interesting about this chart is that usually uh, boards and council members don't usually, um, the PCR doesn't mean much to them. It usually is uh, with the next slide, which is another way of demonstrating uh, the consequences. This is your backlog cost and these, this is your unfunded project. So if we're looking at the 2014 funding, um, in 2014 they were just a little over in $10 million in backlog and by the year 2023, they would have been up over $14 million. So usually it's this slide right here that gets their attention because it's in dollars, but it was actually the PCR slide that really uh, kind of turned the trick uh, for, for the council members. So, but, but we need to be able to convey um, what's happening with the network um, through mm -hmm. uh, these graphics. So CJ, while we're on the topic of communicating with, um, Electeds or other decision makers and influencers about roads. One of the things that we we found pretty interesting was how you were actually explaining a little bit of the science behind um, pavement management and when and where to treat roads and how to spend smartly and things that you know people who are often business people um, or or politicians who may not get roads and pavement might still relate to some of these concepts. So uh, take us through a couple of these slides that you have used. 
um, to help aid you in that conversation. Sure, thanks, Lindsay. So uh, I guess I'm pretty fortunate. I, we have a pretty intelligent board and we, we've been lucky to have one for a while. So I was able to, to bring uh, this, this slide or something similar showing that how the pavement declines, the pavement de declination curve, uh, which you can see there in the red dashed line and what it does over time. So what we had been doing when I came to the agency was waiting until that curve went down to the bottom um, around 2030 PCI, PCR, and then we would rehabilitate the road. Now that's, that's what everybody knows, right? You go out there, you patch a road, you resurface it and it looks good and, and you're hopefully done with it for another 15 years or so. Um, what we were able to show though with, with the help of, of Steve, and with the help of aids like this is that spending the money when the road is in better condition is much more cost effective than waiting until it declines all the way down that curve. And why wouldn't you wanna keep your roads in good condition? Why do you want them to decline and face all those complaints of people calling in? So explaining that to the board, um, they really um, saw the, the value in doing pavement preservation very quickly. I, I, was, I was very pleased. And I'll have to say though, this is something, you know, it's an ongoing conversation, uh, this and all the treatment types. It's not something you just go over once and you're good for, for the rest of your history with your community. I, I bring this up every year. We have a planning conference every year. I bring this up, I show this curve, I go through it again. Every time we have a project, I show where that project fits in with this curve and why we're doing what we're doing at that point. And that helps uh, to refresh their memories or, you know, we have elections every two years. And so we ha have new board members possibly every two years. So that helps to bring them up to speed as well. One of the great tools on this uh, on roadresource.org was designed especially for communication, both to town boards, city officials and to taxpayers over here on the resources side, kind of backing up what CJ is saying, um, if you don't have the resources to kind of consistently present these things to your town board or the tools that you need, this is a great place to start looking. We've got a, a short two minute video that explains the benefits of pavement preservation, recycling, and, and really the big picture of optimized network management and why it's important to keep your network healthy. So that big picture explanation can be a really helpful tool to you as well as some downloadable one pagers that you can put your community's logo on or insignia or name or whatever and um, and pass them out to taxpayers to decision makers um, that help people understand again why are we preserving our roads why are we recycling our roads why what does it mean to have a strategic plan for your road network and look at those things in the big picture so that's at roadresource.org slash tools um, if you're looking for a couple more communication tools to leverage. Um, so we all know that the, the communication is a really important part, but um, the important, really, it makes a difference when you put it to work and stick to it. So CJ, tell us a little bit about um, the planning. Yeah, so this was another graphic that really, really uh, spoke to our board. And what this shows is, is two things. One, the rise in, in prices of the asphalt over time that we we're going through. And this was, or I'm sorry, we'll go the other way. So the decrease in, in um, really the value of money. Um, so that's one thing, you know, you have, you have your budget and every year that money does not go as far, right? It's worth less. At the same time, we had historical rises in the cost of asphalt. So you see that going up, you see the, what the monies um, you have, the worth of it going down. And really, even though you may have a budget that's good now, in two years, that budget may not be good. And we were starting it below the curve. So it, it was even worse for us. Uh, next slide, please. So what we did uh, getting in and looking at the roads uh, and having them look at our network, they came up with a plan. And, and with the software they utilized, they were able to look at the most cost effective way of um, every, Basically, they, what they do is run each segment of our network through a modeling program and see what happens if we do FDR, if we wait 10 years and do FDR, if instead we do crack sealing now, or we wait three years, and we do seal coating. And, 
and the program runs through all those scenarios on every single segment of the road and comes up with what is really on a network level the most cost effective way of maintaining our roads with the toolbox that we have. So that is a great network plan, um, but it is a network plan. So you have to do a few things. One thing we did is we had this plan showing that say in 2015, we're spending most of our money in preservation and then we're sp spending a small segment in thin rehab. Our budget isn't really big enough that we can break it up very easily. So what we try to do is try to stick with one thing every year to use to get bigger contracts and, and get the most um, cost effectiveness with, with our money. If we had broken it up into three or four different pieces in some of the later years, we would not have been able to do all of those things. The other thing that you also have to do on a network plan is to go out in the field and actually field verify that what they're showing in here matches up with what you're seeing. Uh, you know, different people have different thoughts on, on what they may see out in the field. And I will say that they are very experienced, but there's a difference between going out there and riding a road in 10 minutes and writing down what you observe, and then realize, look, I got to spend $600,000, $700,000 in the best way I can, going out there and looking at it and spending 10, 15 minutes looking at that same segment of road to making sure that what they're saying is, is in, in fact the correct way of, of treating it. So, so there's a lot of things that go into coming up with a good treatment plan. Um, yeah. Just right. a, are you, do you want me to go back, CJ? No, 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 you're good. Just a quick note, um, I, we don't have enough time to demonstrate this calculator here. Um, when it comes to network planning, uh, one of the most important things that you're thinking about is the cost of maintaining your road segments over the life of their road. Um, and this life cycle cost calculator page is a great place to start getting people to understand that concept. You can see on this um, example page, um, we have got two roads sort of approaches, maintenance plans. You can see the worst first here in gray where we let the road fail uh, and then mill and fill it with hot mix. Um, or on the, in blue, you can see the optimized strategy, which is to preserve over time. Uh, and you can see the cost differences between the two. It actually pays off for your network. This is a total paved area of uh, 1.5 million. You can see that the um, for your whole network, the cost savings pay off um, by doing the optimized strategy. And this strategy even works, you know, what if my roads aren't all in good condition? Um, what we're seeing is that agencies are using in-place recycling techniques to bring their roads back up to good shape and then preserve preventatively from there on out. So this is a great way to, um, demonstrate that quickly to people who may not understand it. Even if you've got a road completely at the failing condition, an FDR can bring it back up to good health and preserve it from there on out, and still the savings add up over time. So I'm not gonna demonstrate this calculator, but I've got an example put in here. Um, this is just on the other side of that page, the calculator side, if you're interested. What this calculator on the website allows you to do is compare the conventional approach in gray, and an optimized plan in blue, and not only see how much money you're saving by project, but how much money you're saving over time by spending your dollars sooner, because a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow based on inflation and interest. This is a life, this isn't a traditional life cycle cost in the uh, payment management approach sort of way, but what it does is quantify dollars and projects. And again, you can see that over 40 years, the optimized plan to preserve saves money big time. And this is a, a road with 100,000 square yards. So try this. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, while you're on here, you guys may be looking at those costs and saying, wow, my costs are nowhere near that um, because guaranteed your costs are higher or lower. Uh, all of these numbers came from um, a national average study that we did uh, when we built the site. But really the way to get the most out of it is to create an account and populate the site with data that is relevant to your network. So to do that, you go to that login function that Grace is demonstrating. Um, and when you get in there, you can uh, populate it with uh, costs, life extension, uh, structural coefficient, if we're talking about a treatment, a treatment that adds structure, 
all of that that's relevant to you. Then as long as you're logged in, it will automatically change the calculator tools throughout the site. And no one ever sees that data except for yourself. Um, so it's, it's totally confidential. I wanted to mention that while we were there. Thank you. So go ahead and try that calculator out. It's a great way to demonstrate life cycle costs and that spending preventatively for that plan can really pay off in the long run. Um, and so, so what goes into that obviously is a myriad of micro decisions all along the way, all along the roads or your network's life cycle, um, identifying what are the most cost effective and relevant treatments for that site. So a lot goes into a site selection and, and selecting a treatment, um, but anywhere you can, you, uh, your goal is to be saving money with every single project. So CJ, tell us a little bit about your toolbox. Sure, I, I really wish we had those tools when I started out with this. It would have made my job a lot easier. <laughs> the, um, so you see up there that the tools, those are the tools that are currently in our toolbox, um, but we didn't, we didn't start with all those tools, right? So we built this toolbox slowly over time and with experience. Uh, I actually started out with full depth reclamation, which I wouldn't say is pavement preservation, but is a cost effective way of maintaining your network once the roads get to the point where they're failing. And I started with this uh, in probably 2006 at another agency and brought it over. And what, we, what I did was to use that to start introducing our board to more innovative ways of, of maintaining our network. And I think one really important thing is to try to start off with wins. Start off with things that you know are going to work and that you've seen in other places or you've tried yourself um, that you know will work before you start trying them out and before you have that goodwill built up. Uh, so we started out with FDR. Uh, that worked very well. We did it in a, uh, an industrial area and um, it was falling apart and we were able to go back um, using full depth reclamation. We claimed down to 10 inches and added a two inch overlay over that, which is much, much, much less expensive than doing full depth patching over probably 70% of the network and then doing a structural overlay over that. Um, after that, we moved into crack sealing, uh, which is probably the most cost effective way of keeping your network in good condition. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of ugly. So it, it took a little bit of a sell to get there. And then we added uh, on seal coating um, partially to cover over some of those areas that were crack sealed to make them look nicer and partially to help with pavements that were degrading. So can you go to the next slide? I'm going to go through these pretty quick. Uh, so at the top of the curve, this is the first treatment that you may use, a uh, rejuvenator. It's usually typically done in the first three years of the pavement and it puts back those asphaltines and maltines that are lost uh, when the pavement is heated up, actually even before it's placed. So a lot of that, those things are, are lost. Um, the pavement becomes brittle. Putting a rejuvenator back in helps that become less brittle, more flexible, and last longer. And that's something that can be added back in um, every five years is what's recommended. We typically only do one application of this. Next slide, please. Um, after that, we start looking at the possibility of the seal coat. Uh, the seal coat acts as a protective layer. It keeps the surface of the asphalt from degrading due to UV, ray, UV rays from rain and other uh, degradations that happen from environmental factors. Uh, we've tried this, we've tried out several different options, anywhere from a fog seal uh, to a high density mineral bond for a seal coat. And there are positives and negatives to all of these. Uh, you go from a fog seal that's typically less costly, very quick to dry, say 30 minutes and lasts two or three years. On the other side, you have like a high density mineral bond, uh, quite a bit more costly, takes six to eight hours to dry, but it lasts, you know, five to 10 years. So you have to kind of balance out what, what, you, what the trade-offs are and works, what works for you and your community. Next slide, please. And it should also be said too, that, that what works in one community may be different in a different climate or region. So as far as these expectations and things go, Definitely the best way to go is, is ask, a, ask a member or a contractor um, what to expect in your area. Absolutely. So things like the seal coat are much more effective in, say, Arizona and areas like that where they have high UV and a lot less things that will wear off the road, the rain and things like that. So they last a lot longer compared to, say, up north where you have a lot of freeze-thaw cycles, a lot of salt and ice, things like that that wear it off fairly quickly. So, yeah, absolutely. Environment 
plays a, a big factor. And also uh, your citizens, your citizens and your boards, what they expect and what they are good with. You know, the next one, the crack seal, or the, I'm sorry, this one, the crack seal, not all communities may be okay with this. It, um, it's very, very cost effective, but like I said, it's not the prettiest thing you can put down on your roads. Uh, if you do do crack seal, please make sure you do it in the spring or the fall. Uh, if you do it in the summer, once it gets uh, to winter time, the cracks will expand and everything will crack. If you do it in winter and come summer, everything will squeeze together and you'll have a big hump in the road where you put that crack seal. So uh, spring and fall are the most effective times to do that. Next slide, please. Cape seal. So this was a, a big learning thing for me. This was a, an innovative thing that we um, I got the board on on track to do. I took a lot of uh, talking to them because it's not asphalt. Uh, what a micro seal is, is you, um, you put down a chip seal, in our case, a high, high, highly polymer, sorry, this is really a tongue twister. We'll just say polymer modified uh, chip seal. Uh, and what that does is it keeps cracks uh, from, from propagating through. And then you put on a surface layer. In our case, the options were slurry seal, seal or micro surface on top of that. It helps protect the chip seal and, and acts as a wearing surface and also looks a lot nicer. However, it's not asphalt and our board and our community is used to the look of asphalt. So it took a lot of, lot of persuasion and taking pictures and field trips out to see what that actually looks like in place before they gave me the go ahead to do it. Unfortunately, I had another issue or two come up uh, with that. So like Steve said, the right treatment at the right time and for the right road, I think, something like that, the three R's. Uh, what I saw and what I thought was environmental cracking because it looked a lot like map cracking, ended up not being map cracking. It actually was structural cracking and they had milled and overlaid that road before I came to the agency. So that was stru structural cracking coming through, which I found out about two weeks later when the structural cracking kept going through into what I had just done. So that was a big uh, learning thing for me. After that, we uh, purchased a core drill. And now before I do something like this, I do go out there and core every road before doing a, a treatment like this to make sure it is the right road and the right treatment at the right time. Uh, there were a couple of those roads in this contract where they were fine, uh, that wasn't structural cracking. And it's been almost 10 years now and it still looks very, very good. So a loss and a win, I'd say but it's learned, everything's learning. Next slide, please. I guess, I'm sorry, one important thing with that um, is I had built up goodwill and I had a lot of projects under my belt before I got to that first failure. So it's okay to fail, but try to build up that goodwill with your board and the community before that happens. Uh, they understood it once I explained to them, once I had my mea culpa and, uh, and were okay supporting me because it does take failure sometimes to learn. Uh, better ways of doing things. Okay, uh, asphalt patching. This is something that, something that we don't do much anymore. Uh, we only do this in very isolated areas where you may have a pothole or two along a segment of street. Otherwise, we typically wait until it gets to the point where we do the next method, which is uh, the FDR that we talked about. So full depth reclamation is something that I've done for roughly 15 years ago um, now. Uh, you basically grind up the road, you add some sort of binder. In our case, we typically use cement. You can also use asphalt or foamed asphalt as well. Um, you mix it up, you put it back down, compact it, and that acts as the base for your new road, your new road surface. And then you overlay that. Uh, you can use things like uh, slurry or micro. Uh, we typically go back with asphalt on those. So those are all the treatments in our toolbox right now. And, and this is you know just a general curve of what we do and when. I have to say that curve, it varies depending on your network, your environment and your road. So this may be where we are, but if your agency is in the north, that curve is probably a lot steeper. If you are in Arizona, that curve is probably a lot more gradual. So those years won't line up exactly. You really have to go out there and look at the distresses to make sure you are doing the right thing at the right time. So this is typically what we do. You can see um, on the left side is the scale of the, that says PCI, it's actually PCR is what we use. 
um, the different rating factors in the top of the scale typically have weathering and raveling. So to help with that, we start with a rejuvenator in the beginning. We add a seal coat after a few years, and then um, and then we'll go back and crack seal once we start getting some significant cracking. Um, once about the 70, 70 mark on the PCR, uh, you start getting structural issues a lot of times. We'll do some full depth patching, but generally once it gets to that point, we'll let the, let the road continue to degrade until it's time to rehabilitate the whole road and do full depth reclamation. Now, if you notice what is missing from that, from that toolbox, what have we not done? Um, that would be mill and fill. You know, that's something that's done by a lot of agencies. It was done by us when, we, when I first came here, but it's not something we've done in the last uh, 12 years. Uh, that is something I'm gonna start looking at now because we have roads mostly in the top to middle of the curve now. We've gotten rid of a lot of the ones in the bottom. This year, I can spend a lot of money at the top of the curve because the money goes so far, but I should have quite a bit of money to spend in the middle of the curve, which we haven't done to this point. So I'm gonna look at a few different things. We're looking at the mill and fill, uh, possibly piggybacking on to Charlotte's contract since they get, su get such good rates. We also may look at CIR, which is cold in place resurfacing, or HIR, which is hot in place resurfacing, and try to figure out what, what's the best fit for us. I'm sorry, recycling. Yes, recycling. Um, I, one thing I want to I want to turn our attention quickly to just a few questions um, about how, or a few of, of the things that you've done, Grace. Next slide about how you've expanded your toolbox. Um, one thing that I have really taken away from you, if I ask, you know, 20 pavement managers about their toolbox and their approach and their rules for different years, now I'm going to get 20 different answers. So, of course, again, none of this is recommendations for your particular network. You have an incredible slew of contractors, manufacturers, local experts, local agencies who tried all kinds of stuff. But the big thing, CJ, that I, that I think we really took away from listening to you was, one, you were willing to keep trying things. Um, even if something didn't work out exactly like you expected, you were willing to ask why and do it again until it proved out to be a tool that was really valuable for your toolbox. And you really brought your decision makers along with you. Um, and so I think those are two pretty pretty important lessons. Um, so you've tried a lot. So just quickly, in a minute or so, give us a little bit about how you have approached trying new treatments and what has made that a little um, easier on you in integrating such a big toolbox for a relatively small agency? Well, I think the first thing we did is try to, lead, try to learn from others' experiences. You know, why, why spend that money and do it yourself to see how it works when, you know, you can find out what other agencies have done and how well it's worked for them. So a lot of times I'll go through and, and for whatever thing I'm looking at, I'll try to find others that have used it and find out, you know, find out the positives and negatives and then use that to help evaluate it in the beginning. And then if it looks like a good thing, then look at doing maybe a small project, sometimes uh, seeing if another agency in the area may be doing something similar so we can get the cost down or with something out of the area, maybe the contractors going through our area on their way to a larger project and can stop and do it where we are. So I try to do a lot of different things to keep our costs down. Great. One of the tools on roadresource.org was built uh, specifically for this need. This is the Treatment Resource Center that has information underneath the Treatment Toolbox tab, Treatment Resource Center, or you can get to it with this big blue bar. It has um, a, a specialized menu information for each one of the treatments listed here. That's 18 different uh, treatments, all using the same uh, menu organization, which is helpful. Um, you can find things like general information about the treatment, benefits, issues addressed, attributes, and common combinations where the treatment might be used quite often. You can learn things about process and variation, expectations, what you can expect to, uh, to get service life out of the roads uh, applied if this treatment is applied at different conditions, different times in the road's life cycle, all kinds of information from site selection, um, to um, specs, different climates um, where treatments can go down in, construction, quality assurance, um, what kind of testing do I need to do? What kind of inspection should I be looking for? Um, as well as success stories and research and performance that go along with each of these treatments. So right now we're looking at the microservicing page. Um, this information is out there for all 18 different treatments. You can see how to navigate here. Um, 
So if you're looking into trying new treatments, this is a great uh, place to stop and say, what do I need to know if I'm thinking about applying this treatment? What do I need to have confidence that this treatment isn't going to fail? Um, so everything from before you even uh, consider the site, select the site, all the way through pre-construction, construction, acceptance, um, there on out. So uh, give this section a look, the Treatment Resource Center. Again, that's under the Treatment Toolbox tab on the website. So CJ, tell us just a little bit about Matthews today. Um, and then we'll wrap with about uh, five minutes of uh, Q&A. We have some good questions coming in. All right, so where are we? Well, we're in the middle of COVID. I don't know if any of you heard of it, but it's uh, it's keeping a lot of us at home and, and keeping a lot of the dollars that we normally get in out of our pockets. So uh, our budget uh, last year, uh, or going to this year is very tight. Uh, we actually have are not getting raises uh, for at least the first half of the year. We're going to evaluate that later. Um, but based on all of the education we've done, we're actually increasing the amount of funding that we're putting into resurfacing this year. So we're going to be actually at 800000 this year. And it's funny that I didn't ask for it. It's one of our board members that brought it up and said, you know, we really need to spend more money on this. Uh, otherwise, we're going to keep falling behind. Thank you. Great quote here. Um. I, I do think uh, that this is one of the most powerful stories that I have heard in light of COVID is all of the work that you've done to help your decision makers understand the importance of investing in roads and really understand the trade-off of under-investing tease you up really well to uh, be able to protect that budget in light of a lot of budget uncertainty. And so for those of you out there who are dealing with similar scenarios, um, even if you haven't been executing against one of these plans for many years, a few of these tools or graphs or ways of, of sharing out the data may be helpful to you in proactively protecting a budget so that we don't emerge on the other side of this with um, it, it, networks that are so greatly deteriorated. Um, I do want to give a quick nod to a comment that we just got um, because this whole webinars about um, small budgets and big plans. And uh, this came from another pavement manager in North Carolina who maintains 20 lane miles of roads. And they said they've been following a very similar program uh, and using many of the tools that you just shared, CJ, and getting great uh, results with their network. So I think that's pretty neat, just the idea that even if you have not a lot of miles under your care, but doing, um, doing the right things with them and applying this uh, strategic planning approach is, um, is pretty important. Um, do you want to quickly cover the last two slides and then I'll throw um, a couple questions at you? Steve, tell us a little bit about the treated lane miles worst first versus optimized plan for the next few years. Yeah, so uh, it's it's an interesting graphic. You know, obviously with the uh, worst first approach, we're touching like four miles of road over, you know, every year for 10 years. and you know, you're touching like close to 20 miles of road with the optimized approach, you know, and so that's really the name of the game. It's, you know, right treatment, right right, right, right roadway, right time, um, but but you got to keep good roads good, you know, and if you're only dealing with the worst roads, then your good roads are going to end up being worse and you're never going to catch up. So the next slide um, is a, a, a demonstration also is that you know, so you're touching 41 miles with the worst first approach, that's lane miles in the 10 years, and then you're touching 208 miles over the 10 years with an optimized uh, approach that utilizes the full toolbox. You know, and, and if you notice to the slide on the right with the optimized approach, you see the way the, the bandwidths have, are changing with the condition of the network. You know, the, and, and like CJ was talking about, the, the number of iterations to get it to where it's optimal, picking the best projects, and it's going to look different year to year, and it's going to cycle through, and you can see preservation is big in the first three years. It dies down because the network doesn't have the need, but then it comes back, you know, and you can see rejuvenators mm -hmm. introducing into the, into the network as well. Mm-hmm. 
Well, with that, um, thank you for walking us through this history. CJ, there's a couple of really good questions I want to make sure that you hit. There's some that are pretty specific that we'll answer in later Q&A, but there's a couple I think would really benefit the whole group. One is, um, what kind of pushback uh, did you get after starting your preservation program, and what did you use to overcome that pushback? Yeah, I, th I think the, the hardest thing with moving to a preservation program is that you still see those roads going into decline. Citizens are saying, you know, you're spending money over there on those roads that look fine, where my neighborhood's falling apart. Why aren't you spending money on my road? And, and what I was able to do is to go through basically that whole thing, saying it's much more cost effective to maintain the roads in good condition. But we have a plan. Every four or five years, we do go back and, and try to bring those worst roads back up because you can't just leave them there forever. Yeah. And we're seeing trends with agencies, even what you were saying about crack sealing or chip seal or why doesn't that road look new? We're seeing more and more trends with agencies being proactive about communicating the why behind it to taxpayers uh, to understand, look, we're protecting your investment and here's our plan. Um, and some of that predictive work also helps them understand when they might be, uh, when their roads might be addressed. So that's all stuff that we're seeing and, and trying to share that learning from one pavement manager to another. And, and again, those tools Grace pointed out on uh, road resource earlier will help you in explaining some of this to your taxpayers. Um, time interval, uh, so you look like you have some great data about the network. What is the time interval that you use to um, uh, measure the condition of your roads or your network? So we, we try to have it reevaluated every three to four years. Okay. The best practice is three years, but it depends on our budget because the further away projections get, the, the less effective or I guess the less uh, real they are. So okay. three to four years. Okay. Um, and we see some agencies that do like a third of their network each year or some that will do the whole thing every three years. Um, is there an approval process before you apply a new treatment, CJ? Oh, yeah. Uh, so anytime we spend uh, money, we have to go through to the board. So we, we have to uh, make sure everything's vetted. I go through that whole process we talked before, but ultimately it's the board who makes that decision whether you move forward or not with something. Okay. Um, what is, uh, can you comment on the emulsion and aggregates that you prefer in your seal codes and if you had any problems with broken windshield or other vehicle damage? Yeah, and the, uh, so that that's with the Cape Seal. We haven't done that in about 12 years now. So I, I don't remember, I'm sorry, the, the aggregate or emulsion we used, but I can get the spec for you. Uh, we okay. did follow it very quickly though with, with the topping so that we didn't have 